it's important to be patient with the public and try to educate. And I think things like this podcast can help help with that. You know, letting them, letting the people see that uh, we're reasonable people. We see that there are concerns. We don't dismiss those, but we also can't just maintain the status quo because if we do, we're going to fall behind other countries and other industries that are not going to just sit still. They're going to keep moving. I'm really bad at this. Okay. Welcome to Trucking Forward with Tim and Adam, where two former engineers sit awkwardly in a very small room uh, and discuss everything uh, autonomy and trucking and hopefully bring on pretty cool guests. My name's Tim. And my name's Adam. And uh, I honestly have no idea what we're talking about today because um, I, Kylie's gone and Jason took over and his handwriting sucks. <laughs> but... What we're talking about is not as important as who we're talking with. Do you want to introduce him? That's true. So uh, today we're we're talking with somebody that uh, that um, uh, I know from from my past. Uh, one of my former uh, academic advisors, um, somebody who was very early on into the automated vehicle spaces, and has has been in academia for an incredibly long time, and has impacted on a phenomenal amount of students. Um, uh, in his career, um, and that's uh, Charlie Reinholtz. Um, I, I believe, uh, Charlie, you're on the line? I am on the line. Well, welcome. Thanks, good, so, good to be with you. So so jumping in here, and, and I need to let everybody know that might be listening, but Adam's a fanboy. <laughs> um, Adam, you've never met Charlie. Not or, really, yeah, very, only in <laughs> passing. Only in passing? Yeah, like, years ago. Okay. So, Charlie, can you can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of who you are and, and what, your, what your background is? I'd be happy to. <clears throat> I have um, served my entire career since 1983 as a professor and, and various academic appointments in, uh, at both Virginia Tech and then uh, starting, in 19, uh, starting in 2007, the year of the DARPA Urban Challenge, I moved to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and took department, the department chair position there. Um, but that really doesn't tell you a lot about me. My real passion has always been working with students on projects and getting involved with autonomous vehicles very early on in my career and um, doing student competitions. I really think that is the primary thing that I'm proud of in my career. So can you, I guess, how did you get started on student competition? So I guess maybe a little bit of, little bit of background. Like um, you were obviously one of my, uh, my advisors uh, at Embry-Riddle um, for a very long time. And I think we've, we've worked on uh, many projects together um, uh, over <laughs> multiple years. <laughs> um, and I think have a lot of fun stories there. But Kind of before we maybe get to some of those those stories, like how did you get started with student projects? Like what was the genesis of it, and what really led you in that direction? And then, I mean, what you're known for really in academia is your focus on student development, yeah. hands-on learning, um, and the benefits that provides students who then go off and find jobs in this industry. Well, I think you've you've said it very well, Tim. I you know the work the work that you and I did together over the years, and I really appreciate your commitment to the student projects and student competitions. And I, I know that you recognize that a lot of the people at Torque uh, and I went through the same kinds of things together in other competitions over the years. So it, I, I've been, <clears throat> since I first started in academics, I was involved with student projects, things like Mini Baja, and I helped to develop a mock-up of the National Aerospace Plane that was displayed at the Paris Air Show in the 1980s. But the, the real focus on autonomous vehicles came when a student um, who graduated from West Virginia University named Susan Larkin in about 1994 came to me and said, 
Virginia Tech should be involved in the intelligent ground vehicle competition, which was one of just a few autonomous vehicle, student-related autonomous vehicle competitions at the time. And so with um, a lot of help from Susan and a lot of support from other students, we put together a team. And in 1995, we entered our first intelligent ground vehicle competition, which just happened to be in Orlando that year. And we did well in the design competition. We didn't do very well dynamically, um, but we had a real um, great um, <clears throat> collection of students that it became a passion for me and the students. And every year we entered the intelligent ground vehicle competition, and then we branched out and we did the student unmanned aerial systems competition, the international aerial robotics competition, the RoboBoat and RoboSub competitions. And then of course, the really big DARPA challenges. There were three DARPA challenges. And Tim, what you and I lived through together, driving the van for whatever it was, 20 hours each direction to get the competition <laughs> over and over again. I did that with a lot of different students. Yeah. And, um, and it's odd to say, but there's nothing I enjoy better than getting to know students in that capacity. And really, you really feel like you're, I hate to say it this way, but you're sort of going to war together, right? You're on the same team. It's not like a usual academic environment where the professor gives work and the student tries to respond and the professor critiques. It's really the students and the faculty become the same team and work together. And that's, I think that's where all the opportunities and growth really happen. I, I mean, I, as you know, and I'm going to let Adam jump in here a little bit, because I think just going back, back and forth between you and me, you're going to get a, a bunch of the, the same ideas. But I, I fully agree with you, like the, the competitions, that kind of hands on learning and developing of that team effort is, is really um, what helps students who, who participate in those kinds of activities really succeed uh, in the industry. It's, it's about solving problems and solving problems, especially in these competitions. When you get to competition, everything breaks. <laughs> yeah. Right. It I never, <laughs> ne yeah. right. Uh, no, no plan um, survives the battle. <laughs> Right, you you get the competition. You're you're as prepared as you can be, and then you know your robot doesn't turn on, um, and you can't you know, can't compete. And you have to figure out how to you know what is the good enough solution there. And getting in that mindset of of just good enough is is a real challenge. You have to pull together to pull together to do it. Yeah, but maybe I would add to it that maybe you guys don't appreciate since you're in it. And it's just kind of natural for you guys. But coming in and I would say working with those cultures, having never been in those cultures, it's the collaboration. That it's not just that you're fixing it, it's like we're all fixing it. Like everybody's yeah. on the hook for the same thing and the spirit it brings. Um, yeah, Dr. Ron Holtz, I just thinking about it in, so if, I, if I'm hearing you right, it was 20 plus years really of student competitions. If you had to guess, like how many students are you talking about? I'm sure thousands. Yeah, that's over incredible. Over the years. We, we had a lot of great, great teams. We, one year in the intelligent ground vehicle competition, I think maybe 2004, 2005, the Virginia Tech teams that I advised won first, second, and third place. We took, I think, 28 students just to competition that year. Um, so we had multiple vans and <laughs> lots of logistics to deal with, hotels and transportation and feeding people. And um, But it was it was a lot of fun. So yeah, there are always students that are involved that don't go to competition, the real the, the real payoff is going to competition and being in that environment. I wish everybody got to do that, but it doesn't always work out. So one thing I, one thing I do wanna, I, I wanna touch on just briefly, you mentioned kind of sweeping it, uh, sweeping it one year with uh, Virginia Tech at IGVC, but I don't think many people know, and your record may not hold uh, anymore since, since you've retired, but at one point, you had more than half the wins in the design competition at IGVC for the entire history of the competition. More than half the time on that plaque, um, your teams were the your teams were the winner. And I'm curious, kind of, why do you think that was the case? It's true. I don't know if it's true today. I'm probably still about half, but I'm <laughs> I'm going to lose ground. <laughs> that comp that competition is coming up in a few days, and. 
I was not involved in advising that team, although I have stayed involved with some of the teams at Embry-Riddle, but that, that IGVC, Intelligent Ground Vehicle Competition team, I have not been involved with this year. But I really think that's about the doing your homework, right? So some things you mentioned, you go to competition and you put your vehicle in the back of a van and you drive it 1,800 miles and you get where you're going and you hit a bunch of potholes along the way and you stuff things on top of the vehicle and it doesn't work for whatever reason. A wire, a wire broke or something failed that you, know, you, you just didn't expect to happen. Uh, all those things are important, and you can't, but you can't control all of that. So you scramble and do the best you can. That's fun. But the design competitions, it's really about doing your homework and being prepared and getting students that are willing to put in all those hours and dot all the I's and cross all the T's and really work to make good presentations, um, being, being willing to put the time and effort in. In the end, that's what the payoff is for the design competition. So there's, there's, I think there's, in my mind, one extra thing that, so I agree with what you were saying, but one extra thing, which is that you always focus on, uh, if I remember the term you used correctly, the lighters. Yeah, um, yeah. For the oh, I've, heard, I've heard this term, like <laughs> third hand, yeah. <laughs> what have you heard, Adam? <laughs> no, it, it actually came from Andrew Batcha, who I think was a former student. He used the lighters, and I, when I started working for him, he's like, oh, yeah, that's something I pulled from Charlie Reinholds. And I'm like, what's it mean? And he's like, oh. Well, it's this thing. It's where you kind of take it the extra step. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, just the, the, well, what's the thing that's really going to, it's like you can view the judge as a customer, right? So what's the thing that's really going to pull the, pull the judge's attention, right? And get them to focus on what you're doing and think that, hey, that's novel. That's unique. It, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be overwhelmingly impressive or like incredibly complex, but just something that's, you know, novel. Um, so I think one year, the lighter on on a vehicle was uh, just the just lighting up, literally saying, "I'm going to go in this direction." So <laughs> a light would come on and say, "You know, the the left light would turn on if the vehicle was going to turn left. The right light would turn on if it was going to become right." The only vehicle at competition that had lights that indicated which way it was going to go. Very simple to implement, very easy to do, but just a the, the lighter that really brought your attention to. No, they have thought about. A lot of details. Let me dig in with what all those other details are. So, something I think is well, interesting. That started really in our very first year of competition. So, in 1995, in the Intelligent Ground Vehicle Competition, we we went our first time. Other teams had competed the previous couple of years, so we didn't enter the very first year. And so, we had a rookie team, and one of our students. Um, named Scott Winger, who's real, real talent, um, decided that he was going to do the design presentation like a sales pitch. And after he finished and the judges were presenting the awards, the chief judge, who was named Bill Agnew, and he was a brilliant guy, GM uh, lead and also a member of the National Academy of Engineering, Bill looked right at us and said, only one team made a sales pitch to me. And this is a sales competition. You need to sell your product and talked about the delighters. And every year after that, we tried to focus on something, at least one thing, usually two or three, that the judges would notice that other teams didn't do, um, that um, we did just that little bit extra. And one year, it was something so simple. It was the team built a kickstand that they could lift the drive wheels of the vehicle up for testing. So when they wanted to test the motor controllers, for example, they just kicked a kickstand up. And it just so happened when we were making our design presentation, the one of the other teams on the course was lifting their vehicle up and stuffing a cinder block underneath it. And the team, the, the team member that was presenting was able to point out the door of the tent and say, look, that's why we need a kickstand. We don't have to carry a cinder block around with us. <laughs> and the, the judges loved the idea. It was just, again, a real simple, as you said, sometimes it's a, a few simple ideas, but just something to differentiate you from the competition. And I think that's been kind of a hallmark of a lot of the competition teams that uh, we fielded over the years. So one of the things I'm really curious about, because having done kind of the, the senior design, some of the competition space, not really as much, but... What's your secret for motivating students? 
<laughs> yeah, and that's always tough. I, I think it's um, part of it is just knowing that the faculty member cares and trying to encourage people knowing that in most cases they're going way beyond what they need to do, even if they're getting academic credit for it. And sometimes students aren't. The students that really get engaged don't ever get the level of credit that they deserve academically. And so I think it's really being appreciative of the time and effort that students put in and building that kind of a relationship with students. And you, know, there, there, you mentioned Andrew Bacho. What a great talent he was. And you know, we did the same thing, traveled to competition with Andrew. And he, he wrote a lot of the code. When I say we finished first, second, and third and swept that year, a lot of that was because of Andrew's analysis. His master's thesis really distilled out the key aspects of intelligent driving in that competition. And so Andrew was one of the early ones. But I can name dozens of people at Turkey. Um, Micah Vittable is another one that was just relentless. Mike would work night and day. He was an electrical engineer, but he did a lot of the mechanical design work. And there just wasn't anything, like all the good teammates, right? There's nothing that's not part of your job. Um, I think that's kind of key, getting people engaged. Students don't have a lot of trouble seeing the value in these hands-on competitions, but th they need to be given the freedom and the resources to be able to do them. Yeah, it's, it's in reference to Mike working all night, we were actually up with Mike late last night working. <laughs> <laughs> and had mentioned Not to him that you would be on the podcast and he was just beside himself. He was excited. To, he, he was really looking forward to hearing the episode. He just had nothing but incredibly positive things to say about the experience. I think everything that you had done for him directly, done for the folks at Torque, et cetera. So I thought it was uh, just, I think, a testament just for my impression of like Tim calling me a fanboy, everything I've ever heard about you or <laughs> what makes me excited. That's why is because I've worked in a culture and they're like, well, really, that comes from Charlie. And I'm like, do tell. And it's, I don't know, it's just been fun to watch from the outside. Yeah. I mean, well, that's, I think that's a nice compliment. But yeah, let me turn that around, though, and say a lot of my career has been built on the backs of the students that did such great work over the years and showed such commitment. And we, we were able to build a program and be successful in the DARPA challenges. Um, and may, maybe I'm a small part of it, make, giving the opportunity and giving encouragement. But it's really that dedication and commitment. And I learned so much and benefited so much from the, the students that I've worked with over the years. So maybe that's something we can we can jump in on there. Um, you brought up the DARPA challenges. And uh, we've talked on this podcast before with Mike about kind of how Torque got its start, really, um, with the DARPA challenges. And, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about the DARPA challenges and kind of how Virginia Tech got involved and a little bit about that that history and, and what the competitions were like and what the challenges were and I would just be curious about with. hearing like state of technology at the time and yeah, challenges awesome. etc yeah <laughs> well okay um, it was a little primitive um, compared to where we are today <laughs> uh, but it's still impressive the things that we were able to accomplish so the first DARPA challenge there were there were three challenges the first two were just the DARPA challenges, and they were intended to be races across the Mojave Desert, um, long distance races, 100 plus miles across the Mojave Desert. Uh, in 2003 and 2004, um, and the teams I advised at Virginia Tech, um, the first year, the first DARPA challenge, we had uh, Ingersoll Rand, uh, who is the parent company of Club Car, was a big uh, supporter at Virginia Tech, and they donated to us a uh, rather beat up but still functional um, club club car vehicle. So basically, it was a glorified off road golf cart. Um, and we put a full frame PC on it, power supplies, additional batteries. Um, the um, uh, we had a fr frame grabber, a separate card that had to be inserted into the sl slot in the PC to do image processing. So that was a lot more difficult uh, back then. Um, but we entered that vehicle and we actually did pretty well. We made the finals in that competition and uh, were able to navigate the, they had at the um, 
Fontana Speedway, California Motor Speedway, they had qualifying and we were able to navigate through tunnels and avoid obstacles and follow follow GPS waypoint paths and we made the finals. And then the team went out to the Mojave Desert and we were still a pretty small player then. Most people didn't know Virginia Tech or our capability and autonomy, even though we had done pretty well in the uh, in the other student competitions like the IGBC. But we got to the Mojave Desert and we were all staying in tents and the Car- Carnegie Mellon team had this big fancy um, uh, mobile uh, mobile trailer, big RV, and all kinds of fancy equipment, and they had a uh, a Humvee that they had converted to run in the challenge. But nobody made it very far. I think Carnegie Mellon made it a few miles and then drove off course, and the vehicle flipped upside down. Our first vehicle, we we made a mistake right before the um, finals. We made a software change that tried to help regulate speed by applying just a little bit of brake uh, as we were coming out of the starting chute to prevent us from overspeeding as we went down where the crowd was and where the K barriers were. And we overdid it. And so that that software was never tested and it applied the brake, brake a little too vigorously. And the continuously variable transmission that was in the vehicle couldn't overcome the braking force and it just started to the belt just started to spin on the pulley and smoke started coming out of the vehicle and we had to shut down so we made it i don't know a couple couple hundred yards and we were just kind of moving erratically along heading the right direction but it was really a last minute speed control change it was a lesson that we learned that it was it was something we didn't test and um on that morning um, we, we found out it was a mistake. So that first challenge, we only went a few hundred yards. The second challenge, we had two vehicles that both went very similar vehicles. Both were donated from Ingersoll Rand. Both were club cars. One was a diesel power and one was gasoline powered. But we had separate generators on them. And one went 37 miles across the Mojave Desert and the other went 42 miles. So we made a big, big leap. And then finally, we really had it all together. We, all the people that had been involved in IGBC and all the other student competitions and Torque started up in about 2005. And so they provided us with a dedicated team that could focus. And we were able to get a million dollar grant from DARPA to help fund the team. We were able to, at that point, we had some recognition. People realized that we were pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. And we had talented people, but maybe not all the resources that some of the other big teams had. But we got um, Mark Del Giorno from General Dynamics Robotic Systems. And we had a number of external advisors that uh, really supported the team, made donations. Caterpillar came in and was a big sponsor, provided us with a financial base. And so in the DARPA Urban Challenge, we actually completed the full course. Uh, we were one of just a few teams. I think maybe there were four teams that completed the full course, and we finished third overall and won $500,000, that prize money that we were able to split up among all the deserving team members. Nobody got all that much, but it was nice to be able to split it up among all the all the students and, and uh, colleagues that had worked so hard to support the team. That's really awesome. Yeah. That is really cool. So I you you mentioned in there that the Torque started in um, 2005 around that time. Um, can you kind of talk about the impetus for that? I mean, you were involved in Torque's start. Um, kind of where did that come from? Well, <coughs> I I uh, d- I was heavily involved, and Michael F- Fleming. Chris Turwelp, Micah Vittable, Andrew Bacha, Brett Gumbar, there were a whole, uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew uh, Colhane was involved, Cheryl Bowman, I'm probably forgetting a whole bunch of people. But these were all the people that had been involved with the student competitions. We also had a separate contract with um, the Naval Surface Warfare Center at Dahlgren 
to develop a remote control excavator for explosive ordnance removal. And some of that work we found difficult to do uh, through Virginia Tech because of the kind of dangerous nature of the work and some of the liability. So that was really the impetus to start Torque. And I don't even remember the exact collection of people that had that initial ownership in Torque, but clearly Michael Fleming was one of the one of the key players that had a vision for Torque. Al Wicks, a faculty colleague at Virginia Tech, also shared that vision. And so uh, we we did a um, the, the startup like um, like a lot of small organizations do. And I know in the in our first um, LLC application, we actually misfiled and we were for a while a nonprofit or not for profit <laughs> organization. <laughs> so we had to, some of that had to be redone. We, we ended up bringing in once the company started having some success. Torque really was a big player in the DARPA Urban Challenge uh, from the industry side. So it, it was really a great partnership. Uh, to some extent, I regret having to give up my ownership in <laughs> Torque. I, but I've really enjoyed watching and seeing the success that Torque has had. But I know they went through a lot of tough times. You know, they, they were off to a good start at the DARPA Urban Challenge, but businesses usually aren't you know, just a steady uphill climb. You, uh, you encounter a lot of obstacles along the way. And so I know there were tough times after I left Torque, but it's really great to see how they succeeded and all the wonderful things that have happened. Yeah, and I know, I mean, did you have a question, Adam? No, I just, I'm honestly, I'm just kind of listening. This is fun. <laughs> and then I know um, kind of you're really big on student entrepreneurship um, and kind of championing student entrepreneurship and and starting up a, of businesses and, and getting patents and, and ideas out there. I know kind of um, while you were at Riddle, um, that was kind of one of your, one of your focus areas, especially um, in like the, the 2014 and beyond range of like getting innovative ideas out there and, and how do you launch businesses off of innovative ideas. And, um, I'm curious if you can, you know, like, what are some of the most innovative things, uh, you've seen, you know, a student work on or, or an idea come up with kind of in your mind that you're like, you know, that, that needs to be something in the world. It needs to be a business. <laughs> That's a good question because you know I I honestly think good ideas are important. Having having something to build a business on, especially having intellectual property that you can protect, gives you something you can sell to the to the world. Um, so that has real value, right? It's something that if you own a patent, um, you can you can sell that or license it. Um, so people take note of that. But I really do believe that the people are a lot more important, having the talent. And I think starting very early on in my career, I could see that I was working with these students that if I could just keep them together as a group, like happened with Torque. And before Torque, there was another company, kind of a similar venture that we started up called New River Kinematics. And they are still doing great today too two students, Bob Salerno and Joe Calkins. And um, it was really seeing the talent and thinking, boy, if I could just keep these people working together, they're going to be successful. Maybe they're going to be some ups and downs, but they're, the people are just too talented and too, too hardworking. You can't fail um, in the long run when you have that kind of ability and motivation. And so, yeah, I've seen a lot of good ideas along the way. But I think those are secondary to the talent and work ethic of the people that make the businesses successful. That's awesome. <laughs> I'd say kind of on the same lines, I'm curious, just having been at it so long and seeing people go through the various stages of technology, the budding businesses, et cetera, like, what are your thoughts on the industry at large? Like, how, how did we get here? Where are we going? Like, what's, what's your insight there? <laughs> It, you know, it is so autonomous vehicles generally. <clears throat> We've been talking about the promise of robotics and autonomous vehicles for quite a long time. And I think 
people have sometimes unrealistic expectations. They want to know when am I going to be able to get in a car and you know I can climb in the back seat and sleep while it drives me to my destination. And you know we do see the promise of that, but um, it also takes patience. So in the late 1970s and early 1980s, we saw the same kind of a buildup for manipulator arms, right? So robotics, the early days of robotics, where companies began to see the potential for replacing line workers with robotic arms that could do similar kinds of assembly operations. And a lot of industry, IBM was a prime example, uh, went out and they invested heavily in equipment. They bought, they bought um, some of the early uh, robotic arms, Pumas and other things. And then they found out that there were a lot of allied problems that needed to be solved to make those manipulator arms really successful in, in augmenting what people could do. And so there was this period of real excitement and people thinking everybody's going to adopt robotics and all the social fears that come from concern about, well, now I'm going to, I'm going to factory workers are going to lose their jobs or truck drivers are going to lose their jobs. But in, in the end, you can't walk away from those opportunities because they create more opportunities. And so it's dealing with all the ups and downs and all the social issues and not dismissing the concerns that people have about how robotics may have negative impacts. I think it's just trying to deal with that on a steady keel and making progress along the way and not getting frustrated that maybe people had higher expectations or thought things would evolve sooner. So maybe kind of tailing off of that a little bit, I'm curious, in addition to the expectations, what are, what are your thoughts on how like the general public can I guess, consumes it, understands it. What are the things you want them to know? I think it's important for people to be patient. Um, It's okay to be skeptical. And we've been to robotics conferences, AUBSI, where there were, you know, the banner carrying protesters outside the doors of the conference objecting to the advancement of robotics and thinking it was going to take, take jobs. And, you know, now we see I think kind of the broader picture of people's concern about artificial intelligence and the negative impacts that might have. And I I think the key message is to not be an alarmist and not be impatient. Try to monitor the technology as it develops. Uh, But the truth is the general public doesn't really have a very good idea about what's happening uh, with the sensors and the um, intelligence that's being added to their vehicles. And so um, they, they sort of form an opinion, either, either it works well and they like it, or some, for some reason they object to it. But so, sometimes it's hard to understand why people, in the early days of cruise control, there were a lot of people that didn't like the idea of cruise control and said, I'll never use that. I'll never let a car control the speed for me. How will I know that it's not going to just like ram me into the back of a vehicle in front of me? <laughs> um, we, we just see this with technology over and over again. And so I think from, from the side of the technical people, from your side, it's important to be patient with the public and try to educate. And I think things like this podcast can help, help with that, you know, letting, them, letting the people see that uh, we're reasonable people. We see that there are concerns. We don't dismiss those. But we also can't just maintain the status quo because if we do, we're going to fall behind other countries and other industries that are not going to just sit still. They're going to keep moving. So I think um, robotics, autonomous vehicles, um, uh, intelligent systems um, is a pretty pretty broad industry. I think there's a lot of interest from students and and and. Um, people kind of coming up uh, into university programs and things uh, in how do I get into get into that industry and how do I get into programs that teach these things and, and really prepare me for that kind of field and so that I can be involved in that and I guess what would be your advice to 
to young students who are, you know, looking to, to go into the field, what should they focus on? What should they work on? I think we all know, right? You, you, you can't ignore anything. And so uh, communication is important. The ability to write and speak uh, is a big part of uh, what everybody needs as a foundation. Um, but all the, all the technical skills also are important. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, being able to program in different languages um, I highly recommend that getting students getting involved in there are lots of great competitions as you both know there's uh, all the first competitions first Lego League and first technical challenge and first robotics there's sea perch there are a whole bunch of there's best robotics there are a lot of ways that students when they're in elementary school can begin to get involved with robotics and intelligent systems and it can be a lot of fun if it's brought to them in the right way and so you know it's awfully hard to get people to want to learn by di dictating that they have to learn right you have to find a way to get them interested in something and once people find an interest all the other good things happen after that they, they want to become better programmers and they want to understand electronics and mechanics and they want to be able to speak and present well because they want to be able to go to the competitions and impress impress the judges. And so, I th I think it's all mo motivation based. You you can only you can only um, through through threats of of bad grades and reprisal <laughs> and and uh, academic failure. You can only motivate students so much. It really takes that positive reward of giving them an opportunity to people. People love to compete. Um, they love to they love to work with others and collaborate. And giving students the opportunity to do that, in my view, is an underlying key to developing young talent. Awesome. Well, Charlie, we really appreciate we're coming to the end of our time here, and we really appreciate you coming on board. And I know. I can say for myself, I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for the influence that you've had over me over over a decade now. Um, yeah, I would uh, actually double down. I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for the influence you've had on all of around <laughs> me, which I really appreciate. <laughs> well, <laughs> and so, you know, I just I'm going to take this opportunity to our audience of hopefully more than 12 people. Um, so thank you. And thank you for the opportunities you've given me uh, in the past. I know uh, you were talking earlier about appreciating student efforts, but I very much appreciate the effort that you put in um, to convincing me that robotics was um, absolutely the space I should be in. Well, that's that's I appreciate the compliment, Tim, and I want you to know that I'm really proud of you and the work you've done. And Adam, I, I don't know you well yet, but it sounds like you definitely are also uh, someone that uh, would make me proud. Uh, to, I appreciate that. <laughs> to work with them. You know, there, there are there, that whole group of people at Torque that, um, again, I've, I have benefited from the interaction with you, Tim, and with others at Torque, uh, at least as much as you, you have benefited. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, the feeling is mutual. It's been a real honor and a privilege to be able to work with so many talented, hardworking people over the years and to see, to be able to live vicariously and see your success, <laughs> see all the great things you're doing and, you know, be able to share in bits and pieces of that. Thank you. Dr. Reinholds, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks again. My, my pleasure. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> On that, we'll cut that to the all take. So you oh, want us to do Is it, it right? actually recording right now? No, it's definitely. Is that a, a hit on me for the whole? <laughs> <laughs> I it don't think it was. It wasn't, but I now that it's been a long day. Now, now, that, that's, now that it's recording, we've got that as a It is recording now. <laughs> and this has been Trucking Forward with Tim and Adam. We appreciate you listening. Please subscribe to us where you listen to your podcast, or you can look for us on torque.ai. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah, there it got better. <laughs>